Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dunwoody United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you have chosen to worship here with us this morning. If you will join me in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin, and please stand as you're able. The Lord is King. Let the people bow down in worship. Jesus shines like the sun upon our world and in our hearts. Now let us say again what it is that we believe using our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. It's printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you will turn to those around you and greet them and welcome to this place this day. I am, I am David Melton, one of the associate pastors here. And it is my honor and my privilege to welcome you to this service of worship and into the fellowship of this congregation this day. I especially want to welcome those of you who may be visiting with us as first-time guests. If you are, we hope that you'll uh, find your place here among the people of Dunwoody United Methodist Church. There are welcome desks in the narthex uh, out the doors that you came in and then also to the side here where we'll have members of the congregation following the service that would be happy to speak with you about the life of our church. And hopefully in the time of our greeting, you just had a chance to meet someone who also you could ask answers of. We uh, are so glad that you are here with us. In the seat closest to the center aisle, you'll find our fellowship pad, a maroon pad there. We ask that you complete the information there, that you pass it to each person on your pew and that it return to the starting point. And that way we have a chance for folks to begin to know you by name and to be able to share that with you. Uh, this afternoon, I want to remind you at 3 o'clock, there will be an information session that uh, Dan Brand will be doing related to the most recent general conference meeting last week. And we encourage you to be here for that, to hear a report about what took place and the implications as we go forward. We also want to remind you that this Wednesday is the beginning of Lent as we celebrate Ash Wednesday in the imposition of ashes. And we will have a service here in the sanctuary at 630 and we encourage you to come and be a part of that as we begin this time in this holy season. We also want to remind you that uh, our confirmands are on retreat. During this time of year, we have uh, youth in our church who are preparing to become full members in the life of this church and to understand more about their faith. And they're on retreat this weekend, and we ask that you continue to pray for them, for safe travels and also for all that they're learning and participating in and understanding what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We do have a special guest with us today who has been here speaking to several of our Sunday school classes in the chapel during the uh, Sunday school hour. Uh, Tony Loudon is here. And we, Tony, if you would stand and let us welcome you and thank you for being here. And among us, we do appreciate this day. Tony was here to talk about prison ministry and, and his involvement in that. And so it was so good to, to have him with us. I also want to, to tell you that we do have two families that joined our church during the contemporary service this morning. Uh, the Lesse family and also the Cessna families came to join us along with their, their daughters. And so we are so happy that they have come to be a part of this congregation. Now at this time, we prepare our hearts for a time of prayer. We turn to page seven of your bulletin where the concerns and celebrations of our congregation are listed. We extend our sympathy to Lawrence and Laurie Frank on the death of his father, Dr. James Lawrence Frank. To Polly Frederick and Sherry Madison and their families on the death of their grandmother, Mary Cowan. To Susan and Paul Player on the death of their nephew, Trevor Wayner. Nancy Shaw and family on the death of her son, Billy Shaw. Colleen D'Alessandro and family on the death of her son, Drew D'Alessandro. 
and Emily Lewis and family on the death of her brother, Richard Randall Lewis. We remember those names printed and those names in our hearts as we turn now to God in prayer. Let us pray. Creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all, we thank you that you give us this new day, this day to gather to worship you. Show us your new mercies today, O oh God. Open our eyes to see you in action in our lives and in the world around us. Help us to remember your faithfulness to us and help us to be faithful to you in all that we do. God, we know you hear our every prayer. We ask that you hold us in the needs we have put before you, our loved ones, our fears, our mistakes. Hold all of these close to your heart and answer our prayers in ways that further your will for our lives. You created all people in your image, God, and yet we are an astonishing variety. Among that variety, we find some people familiar and comfortable. Others are different and unnerving. Enrich our lives by an ever-widening circle and help us to see your presence in everyone we meet. God, we long to be your people. We long to be your disciples. You are perfect, but we and your church are still on our journey to perfection. Forgive us when we seek our will instead of yours. Forgive us when our words, intentional or unintentional, bring harm to those who hear him. Forgive your church when it causes harm. God, we are a broken church fighting amongst ourselves more than anyone else. Teach us to disagree with one another with honesty, love, and respect. Help us to seek not so much to win, but to be restored to right relationship with one another and to you. Warm our hearts with your hope that we might recognize our brothers and sisters in the eyes of a stranger or even an enemy. Grant all this, we pray. Through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our word comes from the ninth chapter of Luke. You can follow along in your pew Bibles on page 1260. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. And as they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. And then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, you don't out notice from your bulletin that Josh was originally scheduled to uh, preach this morning, and he was. Uh, most of you, I think, know that last week I was out at General Conference, and originally I had planned to, you know, spend my time there, of course, and then come home, and, and so I wanted to uh, give Josh that chance and not have to worry about preparing a sermon for this Sunday. Uh, but as most of you know, a lot happened last week at General Conference, and a lot has happened since General Conference. And I flew home, and right before my flight was about to leave, I think it was Wednesday morning, my son got word to me, uh, he got a message to me that basically said, you know, Dad, I'm a member of a Methodist church, and on this Sunday, I want to hear from my senior minister. And so I thought about what he said on the flight, and as soon as the uh, flight landed, I said, you know what, he's right. And uh, so uh, I made the decision to preach in all three of our services today, uh, for, and for no other reason than I thought that you needed to hear from your senior minister. Now, after the sermon is over, you may regret that that happened, but, uh, but at least for now, uh, that's the choice that I made. So will you bow with me for just a moment of prayer? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you. O Lord, our strength and our everlasting redeemer. Amen. As Josh read just a moment ago, one day Jesus took Peter and James and John and he went up onto the side of a mountain. And there he was transfigured before them. Now that means a very simple thing, really. It means that these three disciples of Jesus, Peter and James and John, began to see Jesus for the very first time for the person he really was. They began to see him in all of his majesty. They began to see him in all of his glory. They began to see him in all of his splendor. They began to see him not just as a great teacher, but as the king of kings. They began to see him not just as, as a great healer, but as the Lord of lords. For the first time, they began to understand not just that he was the Messiah, but something of what that Messiahship would be all about. It was kind of a, a pre-Easter glimpse of what it would be like for Jesus after the resurrection and when he ascended to the Father. Now, we can only imagine what a magnificent experience this must have been for these three disciples. So much so that at one point, 
Simon Peter turned to Jesus and he said something to the effect, Lord, it's great to be up here. This is magnificent. This is wonderful. This is glorious. In fact, Lord, why don't we just build three booths? One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, you'll remember that Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament represented the law and the prophets. One for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. And we can just stay up here. But Luke tells us that Peter didn't know what he was saying. Because you see, while all of this was happening on the mountain, while these disciples were enjoying the glory of that moment and, and Jesus was being transfigured before them, a situation was brewing in the valley below. A father had a son who was extremely sick. And he had taken his son to the other nine disciples who were still in the valley in the hope that they could heal him. But the disciples couldn't seem to do anything for the boy. I'm sure they tried to do everything they had ever seen Jesus do when he had brought healing to people's lives, but nothing seemed to help. And so later, when Jesus and Peter and James and John came down from that mountain, the father approached Jesus, explained the situation to him, and asked Jesus if he could help his boy. And of course, Jesus healed the boy gave him back to his father and Luke tells us that everybody, everybody was overwhelmed with God's greatness. In the liturgical church calendar, this morning is Transfiguration Sunday. It is that Sunday when we remember and reflect and learn from this experience of Peter and James and John and, and of Jesus. It's an important Sunday. It helps to prepare us for the season of Lent, which, as David indicated just a few moments ago, is going to begin on Wednesday with our Ash Wednesday service. But for me, I must confess to you that for me, this story, well, there's just a little bit of a disconnect for me. And that's true for a couple of reasons. For one thing, I have a little bit of a disconnect with this story because these three disciples, Peter and James and John, their experience was so grand and so glorious that I have a hard time identifying with it. Personally, my experience is more like the other nine disciples who were down in the valley, who were trying to minister, but stumbled and fumbled their way along the way. That's more of my experience. But even more than that, I have a disconnect with this particular passage of Scripture because this particular passage of Scripture is both literally and figuratively a mountaintop experience. And I think if you talk to anybody, anybody who attended General Conference or who watched it by way of live stream, they would tell you it was far from a mountaintop experience. It was a time of deep pain. It was very very difficult and for many many people it hurt deeply now I'm not going to talk about this much in my sermon uh, this morning and I know that even as I say that some of you uh, may be frustrated and be left feeling empty you may have come here this morning in the hope that I would talk about General Conference, but the fact is, it is Communion Sunday, and I have about six more minutes to preach a sermon, and a subject like that, to do it justice, requires a lot more time. I'm not running away from it. I'm not trying to avoid it. It's more a question of venue, and so we have set aside a couple of hours this afternoon 
to talk about this very, very important subject. But for this morning, I thought I should be honest with you about my disconnect with this particular passage of Scripture. That said, I can also tell you that there is at least one touch point in this passage that really connects with me. You may recall that the transfiguration of Jesus came at a very critical time in his life. Up to this time, Luke tells us that Jesus had spent a lot of his time teaching and healing and ministering to others. But now the time had come for Jesus to start down that long road, that long journey toward the cross. And Jesus tried to explain this to his disciples. He tried to explain to them that in a very short period of time, he was going to be rejected and suffer and be killed and on the third day rise again. And although Luke remains silent about the reaction of the disciples to Jesus' words, Matthew tells us that they had a very difficult time understanding or accepting what Jesus was saying. And then about a week later, eight days, according to the scripture, came the transfiguration. And you will remember that at one point in that experience, a cloud overshadowed Peter and James and John. And there was this voice from the cloud that that said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And it was on the heels of this experience that Jesus and Peter and James and John went back down the mountain and Jesus cared for the Father and his Son. So what's the point? If you put this passage in its full context of what took place before and what was going to happen afterwards, then I think what God was saying, at least in part, to Peter and James and John was, listen, you have been given a very special revelation. But faith finds its fullest expression in human service, and right now there is need in the valley. And I think that is God's same word to you and me. There is need in the valley. As I alluded to a moment ago, this last week has not been the most uplifting week of my life. In the aftermath of General Conference, I have received something like 8,000 emails. Actually, it's only a couple of hundred. (laughs) But it felt like 8,000 emails. And parenthetically, if I haven't answered you yet, just give me time. I will eventually get to you. Some of the emails expressed very strong opinions on both sides. Some of the emails had questions. Some of the emails just carried erroneous rumors that are just plain not true. It was just sort of all over the charts. But right in the middle of all of these emails, there was one that came to me, and this is what it said. To our wonderful pastors at DUMC, that's a great way to start a letter, by the way. (laughs) Our family was recently on the prayer ministry list, and I wanted to take a moment to let you know how much I appreciated it. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. We've been struggling with several major issues in our household. And to top it off, I had surgery recently. It was so comforting to know that the ministry, and she's referring to the prayer ministry, to know that the prayer ministry was praying for me during this difficult time. I also wanted to let you know how much I enjoyed the recent sermon series, the theme of living joyously resonated with me, particularly now, and helped me cope with the issues we're facing. 
thanks for the beautiful job you did on that series. And then she mentions that my sermons were the best ones in that series. <laughs> no. She simply says, in appreciation, and she signed her name. When I read that email, I was reminded that all across this congregation right now, there are people who are struggling and suffering and hurting. Some are in deep, deep pain because of broken relationships. Some are facing an uncertain future because of an illness. Some are facing extreme financial distress. Some have had the opi opioid epidemic invade their home. And on the list could go. Dear friends, there is need in the valley. All you have to do on any given day just turn on your television and watch the morning or the evening news. And there splashed across the silver screen will be images of people who are homeless, people who are hungry, children who have been abused, families where they have either been the victim of crime or somehow their life got turned in the wrong direction and they started down the road of a criminal life. Dear friends, there is need in the valley. And right about now, I suspect that some of you in here are saying, yes, Dan, there is need in the valley. And one of those needs has to do with the treatment of the LGBTQ community. I agree. We can. And we need to do a better job of loving and caring and welcoming this community into the fellowship of the church. I hope all of us regardless of where we fall on the theological spectrum when it comes to the issue of the marriage and ordination of those who are LGBTQ, feel that way, that we can do a better job. There is need in the valley. Now, I don't want to minimize or trivialize in any way the intense feelings and emotions that have occurred in the aftermath of General Conference. But it occurred to me that this Transfiguration Sunday is as good a time as any to take the special revelation that has been given to you, you, and to me, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And to translate that into human service. In other words, to minister to those who are in the valley. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
service of Word and Table will be found on page four of your worship bulletin. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be the obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, you made covenant to be our sovereign God, and you spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood by your spirit make us one with Christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world 
until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. At this time, I'd like to invite all of those who are to help serve the sacrament to come. And as they're coming, a few words of instruction. First of all, uh, if, if you, those of you in the congregation, if you will follow the instructions of, of the ushers, they will guide you uh, appropriately. Uh, I will say that often we finish on the sides uh, early, and if we finish on the sides uh, and there's a station that's empty and we're still doing the middle, uh, please feel free to move on to the other station uh, accordingly. You do not need to be a member of this church to uh, receive the sacrament in the United Methodist Church. We have an open communion table and all are invited to come and feast at the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we will have, I knew there was one other thing I needed to say. We will have gluten-free bread available at the center stations if you will simply just Mention if you would like to receive gluten-free bread, uh, then they will make sure that you're able to receive that.
Love divine, all love's excelling. As we sing this hymn, if there's anyone here this morning who would like to join this church, whether by a profession of your faith or a transfer of your membership, I invite you to come as we stand and sing. Will you stand? for your presence this morning. When you go from this place, go in the knowledge that Christ is going before you, beside you, and he'll be with you every step of the way. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in you and with you and fill you today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Amen. <laughs>